Okay, guys, this is a uh, mad. Uh, I'm the scratch that. This is now. Um, today I'm gonna be finishing up um, African history because you know this ain't taking too long for me personally. I don't got time to be taking ten years just be talking about African history. So um, I want to finish it up on Facebook and take it on to Instagram. So um, we could at least know, um, you know, the entire history of the actual Africans from you know all around the on this entire planet, not just this um, slavery joint. We talking about like the actual long behind history of ours. Um, now, actually, the interesting thing here is we're taking it from their site. If you could see it. It's right up here um, this is actually their website this isn't you know the black website this is let me scroll up okay. see this is actually their own website so we're gonna be actually taking this information from them um, the history we're gonna be talking about is Spain um, when they was brought to Europe um, by the Phoenicians um, so that's where we're gonna start um, telling uh, you know the history um yeah so this is gonna be fun boring but fun it's gonna be boring so history is boring to me so i know you guys are gonna be bored especially so let's begin i'm gonna pause this so i can plug in my battery my laptop charger and then we go start immediately now why why am I going through all the trouble just to talk about African history? Um, you have to know something. Um, African history is pretty cool. It's boring, but if you like know everything we did in the past, you you'll be like very proud. You say, "Dang, we did this! Oh shit, we did that! Oh shit! Oh cool!" So like. You know, it brings a sense of um, value in your life. Instead of the, the, the same old slavery thing that just keep beating up in our heads, I'm learning about the actual history of our ancestors. Bring a sense of pride, a sense of happiness, and also like just knowing the history itself. If like anytime you get lost, you just go like directly to the roots. And you, the roots, like, like they always say, the roots. Anytime you're lost, just go back to the roots. Like the roots know the answer that whatever you know you're lost in. Um, also, learning history. Uh, learning history gives you in a sense of where or why, you know, what you want to do in the future. Because you know you don't want to make the same mistake as what we may have had. Because our ancestors left us. A lot of crap to fix up. So um, by us, I mean you know the youth, um, the 18, 19, 20, 25, 30, max. That's what I said. So now we have to fix the problem that they left behind. Um, so, but we can't fix the problem if we don't know what the problem is. So right now we do know. What, right now I know what the problem is. Uh, the problem, you know, obviously in. Um, Northwest North Mexico or America, um, there's a lot of shootings, you know, um, a lot of people further getting killed for no reason, etc. Um, so, you know, we see the problem, but what caused us to actually get there? Uh, so that's why I'm actually going to be like going over. Um, yeah. So now, let's begin. So we'll be. So, um, I'm going to be just reading. Now, all you got to do is just bear with me because, you know, my reading is terrible. Terrible. Bo, 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 bo. Um, yeah, so, you know, earlier today, I just got soaked. Like, three weeks ago, they stole my car. And I still don't know how to get it back, unfortunately. Still don't know. Yet. All right, so, you know, as you can see, Oh yeah, by the way, this website, um, I found it online. I was just 
just looking for other places to go, like a blackhistorywebsite.com. But, you know, it's good to hear different sides of the conquering of Spain. Um, yes, Muslims conquered Spain. So, Muslims are Moors. Moors are Muslims. Muslims are dark brown, dark slash brown slash light skinned people. But we wasn't known as dark brown light skinned people. We're just known as Moors. There wasn't no type of coloring back in back then in those days. There was Moors. Period. Right now, the coloring structure just came in about just you know do their best to divide us. Just like how to try to divide North Africa from the entire continent itself. But again, we are just Moors. We're not some type of crayon. We never was, you know, we're still not. We just keep assuming that we are crayon based people. So, let's begun. Obviously, this is the tough picture. Um, I think this is, this picture right here was when the finally kick. Um, the last king of Granada out, um, King Fettelman and Isabella, Queen Isabella received the key of Granada. So when they had kicked out, you know, the last African dude from Granada. So the story of the, the greatest nation, you're talking about Spain. Um, so technically a little... Uh, little note this is what they teach in um, their classroom um, you know the Caucasian classroom about our history um, they don't teach this to our kids they want our kids to continue believing in belief system like you know Jesus a lot of belief system type thing but not the actual real history so like like they will tell us like you know Prophet Muhammad came give us the book Jesus came give us this but they're not going to actually tell you what exactly happened in that time era. Did, did anybody date it? Did anybody did this? Did anybody did that? That's why people always say that um, they know our history. They know African history. African history is black history, Jamaican history, Haitian history, um, African history, and Native American history, Indian history, whatever, you know, all those thousands of people are. Copper, brown, light skin, dark skin people, whatever you want to call your, whatever crayon you want to call yourself the next day, that's African history or indigenous people history. Overall, or El Marab or Moroccan history or Moors history or Muslims history. They're all the same from Egypt to the Phoenician, from the Phoenician, the Phoenician to the Kushite, from the Kushite to all these other nations that, that spread out of Africa from that. All the way to America, Jamaica, you know, all the Caribbean island, all of that, you know, consists of, you know, all of that are still African history, including even the Arabs. They're still Africans by birthright. So all of them, all their history too, are still African history. So that's why I say you have to know your ancestral history. They're no different from me and you. They're just, just because they look like Drake, that don't mean, you know, oh, you know, they're different people. They're still the same people. We're, we're all still the same people. We're not. We're not crayons. We're human beings. We go, but we rule by nations, not by colors. So that's the problem that we're in today. Because you know we're thinking that we you know we're crayons. That's why they keep you know, just killing us. But um, you know, I'm not gonna go into that. Once I'm done with this whole long book, I hope it doesn't take me no more than at least. Jesus, I've been talking for eight minutes. No more than at least um an hour or two. So if I'm as long I'm done, I'll be happy. Okay, so you know, as you know, you could definitely read along. Um, I'm not really, you know, gonna read the you know the, the beginning of Spain, the ethic. Sorry, I'm better. I'm better reading too. By the way, the Gothic Kingdom. It has been said that nations like individuals have their birth, growth, manhood, old age, decay, and death. Many of the stories already told in these pages confirm this declaration. Perhaps the most impressive example of modern time is that of Spain. She came into being many centuries ago, climbed to the greatest heights of power, influence, and glory. And though she still exists, 
she is in a condition of senility and decrepitude, which, like that of the tottering nonagenarian, suggests a collapse not far distant. The earliest historical mention of Spain found its inhabited by a people who sprung from the num from a number of different races to the Greeks and Roman. The country was known as Spania, Hispania, and Iberia, and in the script in the scripture the ship of Tarsus. So those are the different names of them. Probably refer to those of the Phoenicians, which traded with Spain. The colony of Gerda or Cadiz was planted by the Phoenicians about 1000 BC at which time they found the southern part of the country in the possession of the Iberians. It is uncertain where the latter came from as a people they were short of statures with a swiftly complexion. Pay attention to that word, swiftly, <laughs> complexion, yeah, and plentiful black curly hair, we have curly hair. <laughs> Investigations seem to indicate an, an infinity an infinity with the Kibbutz tribes of the Atlas instead of an, or, of an Aryan origin. Now let's first look at this Keebling tribe, right? I want to make sure you know you guys are black folks. Come on, show me black. Damn. You show me black. God damn. Okay, like Keebling people, the Keebling people, blah, blah, are Berbers. Berbers. Look up that. You're talking about black folks. Ethnic group indigenous to the Kiblia in the north of Algeria spread across the Atlas Mountain 100 miles east of Algeria. They represent the largest barber speaking population of Algeria and second largest in the, the continent of Africa. Okay. Now let's look at up another word swiftly. I don't know what the heck that is, but it says swiftly. Complexion Let's look. So who who were they talking about? Are they talking about these guys? Let's look at the picture. I mean obviously you know these days not gonna really show you. So I'm guessing Namek Namincha. They're not really gonna tell us, you know that easily. Like, oh these Venetians, Greeks, and Romans are a swift, swiftly complexion. Swiftly means dark skins. Oh, snap. Snap. If you like tall, dark, and handsome, man, you find a swiftly complexion attractive. Not everyone with dark skin is swiftly. The word is usually used to describe someone whose skin is weatherly beaten and darkened by the sun or has an olive complexion so technically people that look like drake and below and also people of darker complexion now um, let's look at this map very important the french empire which is you know up here um can i draw let me see if i can bring my paint Cadiz was the most important settlement made by the Phoenicians, who induced the natives to develop the mines whose richness became famous and soon led other nations, among them the Greeks, to send expeditions thither. The strangers were welcomed, and since their only purpose was to procure all the gain they could, they made no attempt to interfere with the government of the country. We owe to the crude alphabet brought by them the more reliable history that has come down to us from those remote times. Naturally, it was trade which gave the great Phoenician city of Carthage a foothold in Spain. 
At that time Carthage had no armies, but after her defeat by Rome in the first of their tremendous wars, the grand project of forming Spain into a Carthaginian province was conceived by Hamilcar. He was surnamed Barca Air Barak, or Lightning, and when very young was given command of the Carthaginian forces in Sicily, 247 BC, at a time when the Romans had full possession of the island. He maintained a long and successful warfare against them, but the defeat of the Carthaginian fleet compelled him to withdraw from Sicily, 241 BC, and he became commander of the Carthaginian army. It was about 236 BC that he entered upon the campaign whose aim was to found a new empire in Spain, from which, as a base, he might attack the Romans. He advanced westward while the fleet under command of his son-in-law, Hasdrubal, cruised along the coast. Crossing the Strait of Gibraltar, Hamilcar attacked the natives and steadily bored his way to the heart of the country. No force could be gathered to make a successful resistance and he subdued many tribes and cities and gathered such a stupendous amount of plunder that it interfered with the advance of his army. He spent nine years of conquest in Spain and then fell in battle. You will recall, was the father of Hannibal, one of the greatest of all military leaders. You have not forgotten that the lad inherited from his father his hatred of Rome. In his later years, when in exile, he related the following anecdote, When I was a little boy not more than nine years old, my father offered sacrifices to Jupiter the best and greatest on his departure from Carthage's general in Spain. While he was conducting the sacrifice, he asked me if I would like to go to the camp with him. I said I would gladly and began to beg him not to hesitate to take me. He replied, I will do it if you will make the promise I demand. He took me at once to the altar at which he had offered his sacrifice. He bade me take hold of it, having sent the others away, and bade me swear that I would never be at friendship with the Romans. Hannibal, as we know, faithfully kept his youthful oath. After the death of his father, he was employed by Hasdrubal, his brother-in-law, in most of his military expeditions. He won the enthusiastic love of the soldiers by his heroism and noble character, and when Hasdrubal was assassinated, the army with one voice chose Hannibal their commander-in-chief. Though he was only in his 29th year, before entering upon his life work, that of fulfilling his pledge to his father, he spent two years in the conquest of Spain. Saguntum was a city in alliance with Rome, and Hannibal attacked it on the ground that its inhabitants were making aggressions on some of the subjects of Carthage. The story has been told of the fall of the city after a siege of eight months and after it had made a vain appeal to The story has been told of the fall of the city after a siege of eight months and after it had made a vain appeal to Rome for assistance. In capturing it, Hannibal violated the treaty made by his father and in 218 BC brought on the Second Punic War. The campaigns that followed were among the most remarkable in history and brought to Hannibal a fame which places him among the foremost military geniuses of antiquity. After having maintained himself in Italy for upward of 15 years, he was recalled to Africa to defend his country against Scipio, who defeated him with great loss and peace was concluded in the following year, 201 BC. What is it? This is not good, dog. This is now. Now, Hannibal the Great is just not. See? This man right here. Obviously, a brown complexion. You know, African, African American, Jamaican looking dude, Haitian looking dude. So, um, yeah, you know, all about looking dude. Anybody, you know nose and everything else. So we're talking about this is Hannibal, not the other guy. The other guy is the whitewashed version. Um, you know, you can read his whole story right here, blah, 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 blah. So that's on you, but that guy right over, yeah, Hannibal the Great. And I say all, all history started from slavery.
This is Hannibal the Great. Again, let's go back to here. Um, let's go up. Remember, like I told you earlier, every single empire that's on this on this map is all black empire. Literally, the French Empire, the Britannian Empire. I don't know about Lion. Lion is pretty much you know the Eurasian Caucasian Empire, but everywhere else is the majority black empire. Okay. All right, so now I'm about to stop this and I'm moving forward. The of Sagentum by Hannibal seems to have drawn the serious attention of Rome for the first time to Spain. Its importance was seen, and the future empress of the world began to send armies thither. The Romans drove the Carthaginians from the peninsula in 206 BC and made the country a Roman province. The Romanizing of the country went on steadily for centuries, and to this fact Spain owes the basis of her language and many of her customs, traits, and peculiarities. Not until 25 BC, however, did the Cantabrian Astures in the extreme north lay down their arms to the Roman conquerors one of whom was the illustrious Julius Caesar. The country having been finally reduced to subjection was divided into the three provinces of Terraconensis which embraced the northern and eastern provinces Baetica, Andalusia and Lusitania, which included Portugal and certain of the western provinces. This division of Spain lasted down to the reign of Constantine the Great 306 to 337 and until his death her condition was highly prosperous. The Roman occupation was of great advantage in every respect to the Spaniards. They were forced to cease their wasteful intestine wars and to give their energies to industrial pursuits. They adopted the laws, language, and customs of their conquerors, and the population increased rapidly. In numerous parts of the country Roman towns sprang up, while many aqueducts, bridges, amphitheaters, and buildings were erected, whose ruins are the wonder of modern tourists. For 300 years Spain was the richest province of the Roman Empire. It was for a long time the granary of Rome, and gold and silver flowed thence like a river into the coffers of the imperial city. According to Gibbon, 20,000 pound weight of gold was annually received from the provinces of Austria, Asturias, Galicia, and Lusitania. Spain was withdrawn from military history for 400 happy years and then the shaggy warriors from the German forests came rushing down upon southern Europe. These Goths did not have to occupy France long to discover the riches of neighboring Spain and nothing was more certain or natural than that they should move forward to occupy it. Rome could do nothing, for she herself was besieged by Alaric and purchased her ransom by paying two and a half tons of gold, fifteen tons of silver and valuable silks and cloths in profusion. Then Alaric died most opportunely for the Romans, who began negotiating with Atalphus, the brother and law and successor of Alaric. These negotiations recognized the mastery of the Goths in southern France and in Spain, which were presented to them as a gift. The Goths having no objection to becoming nominal subjects of the empire on the single condition of military service. Indeed, it may be said of these Goths and Romans that they mutually conquered each other, for, though the barbarians were wild and savage, and able to beat down the others in battle, they began to learn the wisdom of employing their minds and bodies in more useful pursuits than fighting and hunting. Before Atalphus could occupy his new empire, he had to drive out the Sueves and Vandals, who were devastating it, but he and his lusty followers completed the work. And in Narbonne he established himself with a Roman bride. She was Placidia, sister of the Roman Emperor Honorius, and was among the captives taken in the siege of Rome. Atalphus fell in love with her and asked her to marry him. The Tani chieftain had already captured the heart of the Roman maiden, and she consented. The emperor held this mighty warrior for the time in awe, and to win his friendship approved the marriage. Atalphus was anxious to retain the goodwill of the emperor, and, therefore, devoted his energies to warring upon the Vandals and Sueves, who were the enemies of both. 
there was a Roman who had also wished to marry Placidia, and he persuaded the emperor Honorius to attack the Goths. They were driven out of Gaul and retreated into the Spanish country. Atalphus withdrew to Barcelona, where he established his court and made the city the capital of his kingdom, to which he gave the name of Hispania Gothia. Still anxious to conciliate the emperor, he strove to introduce among his people the manners and civilization of the Romans, thereby offending his own followers, who thought his course weak and womanly. You can understand that Atalphus did not hold the most enviable situation in the world, and he must have had a hard time of it for it was all important for him to keep the goodwill of his turbulent warriors and to retain the regard of his high-spirited wife. He succeeded in the latter, but not in the former. Six bright, affectionate children were born to the couple and received careful training, but the soldiers and officers were soured at sight of their leader becoming Romanized. They were angry when ordered to fight beside the Romans, whom they hated, and this made the trouble still greater. One day, while the king and his family were watching the evolutions of his cavalry in the courtyard of his palace at Barcelona, a dwarf stole up behind Atalphus and drove a sword into his back. So intense was the resentment against the assassinated monarch that the agonized queen could find no one to avenge his murder. A relative, Sigurek, succeeded the dead king and showed his anti-Roman ferocity by slaying the six children of Atalphus and compelling his widow to walk barefoot through the streets of the city. Such fiendish cruelty turned the anger of the people against Sigurek, who, a few days later, also fell by the dagger of an assassin. The Goths were more fortunate in selecting Wallia as their next king, for, though he detested the Romans as much as his predecessor, he was tactful. He pleased his own people by sending an expedition against the Roman possessions in Africa. His fleet, however, was baffled by a tempest and his soldiers scattered. Before he could bring them together, a Roman army advanced against him, and he found himself in imminent danger. A singular solution of the difficulty resulted. Constantius, the commander of the Roman army, was the admirer of Placidia, who had been won away from him by Atalphus. Constantius had been told by the emperor that he might wed her if she would agree, and the general, therefore, came rather to woo than to war. As soon as the two armies encamped within sight of each other, Constantius sent a proposal to Wallia that they should make peace. The condition being that the Gothic leader should surrender Placidia, widow of the dead chieftain. You may be sure that Wallia was glad enough to do this, and he proved his wisdom by winning the ardent support of his followers in the steppe. He led them against the barbarians of the north, who had dared to occupy a country that the Goths claimed as their own. The campaign was successful, and the Vandals were compelled to withdraw into Galicia, while the Sueves saved themselves by claiming the protection of Rome. The grateful emperor gave the lands in southern Gaul, from Toulouse to the sea, to Wallia, who made the city his capital and lived there until his death a few years later. The successor of Wallia was Theodoric I. 418-451, son of the great Alaric who lost his life in the bloody struggle against Attila at Shaloni, leaving his throne to his son, Thorsmund 451-452 who was assassinated by his brother Theodoric II, 452 to 466, and he, after reigning a number of years, fell by the hand of an assassin, who was also a brother, named Eurek, 466 to 483. What a condition of affairs, when two rulers obtained their power by each assassinating a brother. Yet the reign of Eurek was brilliant and successful. He greatly extended the power of the Visigoths both in France and Spain, introduced the arts of civilization among his subjects, and drew up a wise code of laws for the government of his people. It will be seen that the Goths had made great advancement in civilization. Euric doubtless considered himself the equal in all respects of the Roman emperor. The language of the kingdom was Latin, but corrupted by the tongues of the earlier tribes, to which confusion the Goths added by a mixture of their own words. 
though their books were written in Latin. The government had the form of an absolute monarchy, though the prelates of the church possessed so much influence that it was really a theocracy. Since there was no royalty or nobility of descent, every chieftain considered himself as good as the king, for there was always the possibility of his becoming one. While it would take too much space to give the particulars of the rule of all the different Gothic kings, we must dwell for a brief time upon the career of Roderick, who, through various difficulties, became ruler of all Spain in the year 709. This was a century after the amazing success of the Arab Muhammad, who had set in motion that wave of conquest, in which the Muhammadan hosts declared their purpose of conquering the world, and soon swept over northern Africa and western Asia. Roderick was fiercely threatened by rivals for the throne, who were favored by the church under the Bishop of Toledo. Count Julian, one of the foes of the king, held a virtually independent command in Africa, where the Goths had the posts of Suda, opposite Gibraltar, of Tangier, and of Arsilla. Julian had defeated Musa, the Saracen leader, who to his astonishment one day received a visit from the victor, with an offer to surrender all the Gothic posts on condition that Musa would use the Saracen army to aid the enemies of Roderick. Musa was so impressed by the magnitude of the treason that he sent the Count to the Caliph in Arabia. The Caliph was highly pleased and directed Count Julian to return to Musa with his approval. To test his sincerity, Musa sent a number of his troops to the northern shore, where under their leader, Tariq, they were allowed to plunder as they chose without molestation. The glowing reports brought back by these visitors led Musa to send Tariq once more with a larger force. The name of this leader is perpetuated in the name given the town where he landed, Tarifa. Indeed, he has supplied all modern governments with a word by which he is likely to be forever remembered. Our tariff comes from the duties collected by the Muhammads at Tarifa on all goods entering Spain. Gibraltar is also Ebel al Tariq, the mountain inn of Tariq. Despite the treason of his officers, and history contains few instances of equal perfidy, Roderick prepared to make the best resistance he could against the invaders. He hastened against them with a force so numerous that the Moors of Tariq were terrified. They were only some 12,000 in all, and it was said the Goths numbered 90,000. This battle of Zeers, fought on the plains of that name, near Cadiz, more than a thousand years ago, ranks among the decisive struggles in the world's history. For its results were of momentous importance. The disparity of numbers by no means indicates the true relative strength of the armies, for many of the Goths had no defensive armor and their weapons consisted of short scythes, clubs, axes, slings, bows, and lances. Worse than all, was the disaffection among a large number of the officers and troops. Some who dared not act openly, merely waited to see which way the battle promised to go, with the purpose of joining the successful side. So as to claim a part of the reward. The army itself was too large to be handled well, and there was no commander equal to the task. In the height of his great career Napoleon Bonaparte expressed the doubt that there were two generals in France capable of effectively handling a hundred thousand men. Exactly the opposite state of affairs existed in the Muslim army, which was compact, ardent, well-armed, highly disciplined and fanatical in its heroism. Tariq, their commander, was idolized for, as his own caliph declared, he was one of the best swords in Islam. It is said the battle lasted eight days, but probably several were spent in preliminary skirmishing, and the severe fighting lasted but a day. The struggle opened at dawn on Sunday, July 19, 711, and for the first day or two inclined to the side of the Goths. One inspiring cause that nerved the Saracens was the fact impressed upon them by Tariq that he had burned their ships, and they must win a victory or be utterly destroyed. For the Goths were in front and the sea was behind them. All that mortal men could do they were certain to do. They hurled themselves upon the ranks of the Christians with irresistible fury. Tariq himself singled out a knight clothed in brilliant armor, and, believing him to be Roderick, fought away through the defenders and slew him with his own hand. 
The Muslim soldiers were fired to enthusiasm by the deed, which, in the Gothic ranks, caused dismay, confusion, and panic. At this critical moment a strong body of Roderick's foes is said to have drawn off and joined the Muslim troops. Be that as it may, the Gothic army was utterly routed and fled in wild, headlong confusion, with the Moors in merciless pursuit, cutting down and slaying the terrified fugitives. Until no more food remained to the dripping swords. The losses on both sides were frightful, but that of the Goths must have been more than double, perhaps three or four times as great as that of their conquerors. It was never known what became of Roderick. By some it is said he was indeed slain on the field, though his body was never found. Another legend is that he was swept along with the frantic army, and that, exhausted from his wounds and exertions, and oppressed by his ponderous armor, he reached the marshes of the river Guadalete, where he was either slain by his pursuers or drowned. His riderless steed was found, and near the spot a royal crown, a purple mantle, and a sandal embroidered with pearls and emeralds. The end of it all was that Spain was delivered helpless and bound to the Muslim invaders, and the whole current of her history abruptly changed. This was the message that Musa, the governor of Africa, sent to the Caliph Wella that Damascus, O commander of the faithful, these are not common conquests. They are like the meeting of the nations on the Day of Judgment. And the solemn ecstasy of the Muslim leader was natural, for he and all his people stood almost breathless at sight of the completeness of their triumph. It was Tariq who had won the astounding victory, but Musa, his superior, was moved by a base jealousy to go to treacherous lengths to rob him of the glory and claim it for himself. He succeeded partially for a time, but Tariq, the idol of his soldiers and one of the most daring and chivalrous of military leaders, was beloved by his caliph, who had learned of his wonderful achievements and he saw that full justice was done the hero. Musa himself was punished with such ferocious cruelty that with all his meannesses one cannot help pitying the old man who deserved better treatment from the country he had faithfully served. Although the mortal blow had been struck against Spain, a good deal of work still remained to be done by the conquering invaders. Tariq was the one to follow up his success without a day's unnecessary delay, although in doing so he had to violate the express orders of Musa which bade him remain on the defensive and await his superior's arrival. Tariq separated his forces into three divisions and advancing over the peninsula met little trouble in reducing city after city. One of his officers was dispatched with 700 horse to seize Cordova. A rattling hailstorm and the dense darkness allowed them to approach a weak spot in the walls undetected. They rushed through, and the city was speedily left with no choice but to surrender. It was placed in charge of the Jews, who were staunch friends of the Muslims because the latter did not persecute them as the Goths did.
Aided by the Jews and by the panic which clung to the Spaniards, the Muslims subdued them in every quarter. Malaga surrendered and Elvira, near the present site of Granada, was stormed and taken. Theodemir made a valiant defense in the mountain passes of Mercia, but was rash enough to fight a battle on the open plain, with the result that his army was annihilated. Theodemir escaped with a single attendant to the city of Orihuela, which he saved through a trick which has become dear to storytellers. Hardly any men were left to garrison Orihuela, most of them having fallen in the field, so Theodemir made all the women put on male attire, draw their hair under their chins to imitate beards, wear helmets, and carry long rods that looked like spears. Then they were lined up along the ramparts, and, in the dusk of early evening, the Muslim general did not dream that they were not what they pretended to be. He saw that a desperate fight was inevitable, with doubtful results, and was gladdened, therefore, at sight of a knight with a flag of truce issuing from the gates. For the purpose of negotiating the surrender of the city, the general, who was a son of Musa, and a brilliant leader, was prepared to listen to a demand for liberal terms, and he heard it. The knight impressed upon him the fact that the city could defend itself for a long time, but his master was anxious to spare the lives of his soldiers, and knew the magnanimity of the Muslim commander. He demanded, therefore, that the inhabitants should be allowed to retain their property and become peaceful tributaries to the Moors. Upon this condition they would surrender without striking a blow, otherwise the garrison would fight to the last man. Abdulaziz expressed his willingness to grant the terms and suggested to the messenger that he should return and lay them before Theodemir. That is unnecessary, replied the Goth. For I have full authority to conclude the matter and sign the treaty. Accordingly the terms of the capitulation were immediately drawn up and signed by the Muslim general who handed the pen to the other for him to attach his signature. He did so with a bold sweep of his arm, and the name he wrote to, it was, Theodemir. Abdulaziz was astonished to find he had been treating with the famous Gothic commander himself, but he complimented his adversary on his cleverness, and thanked him for the confidence shown in his generosity. The reader may be interested in the words of this remarkable document which, yellow with the mold of twelve centuries, is preserved in the Bibliotheca Arabico Hispania Ascuriolensis of Kossiri. It was drawn, up in Latin and Arabic, and the translation reads, In the name of God, clement and merciful, condition of Abdulaziz, son of Musa, son of Nasser, the Theodemir, son of the Goths, Tadmi Ribbon Gobdos, peace is ordained. And this shall be for him a stipulation and a pact of God and of his prophet, to wit, that war will not be waged against him or his people. That he shall not be dispossessed of or removed from his kingdom, that the faithful shall not slay, nor subjugate, nor separate from the Christians their wives or their children nor do them violence in what pertains to their law, religion, that their temples shall not be burned, with no further obligation on their part than those herein stipulated. It is understood that Theodemir will exercise his authority peacefully in the seven following cities, Orihuela, Valencia, Alicante, Mula, Biscarat, Aspis, and Lorca, that he will take nothing belonging to us and will neither aid nor give asylum to our enemies, nor will conceal their projects from us, that he and his nobles will pay a dinar a gold piece per head yearly. Also four measures of wheat, four of barley, four of must, four of vinegar, four of honey, and four of oil. Vassals and people liable to tax will pay the half. Agreed to on the fourth of the moon Regib, in the ninety-fourth year of the Hegira, April, 713. The present writing is signed by Admin ibn Abda, Habib ibn Abi Obeda, Idris ibn Maisara, and Abu al-Qasim al-Mozeli. Early the next morning the gates of Orihuela were thrown open and a force of Muslims rode in to take formal possession. When Abdulaziz looked around and saw only a few men, he asked Theodemir what had become of all whom he had seen upon the ramparts. Theodemir then smiled and explained the joke he had played upon the Muslim. Abdulaziz was a man who could appreciate a jest of that nature, and he laughed heartily and praised Theodemir for his quick wit. He honorably kept the letter and spirit of the agreement he had made, and, while he remained in Orihuela, he was treated as a guest and not as an enemy.
Sad to say, the Caliph of Damascus in his resentment against Musa, who had used to wreak so ill, caused this generous son of Musa to be beheaded. at the hands of the Muslims, who soon left the province to occupy the other cities in southern Spain. Murcia and its seven cities, because of the friendship of the two commanders, were treated with leniency and were garrisoned with only small parties who, in every instance, obeyed the orders of Abdulaziz to act generously toward the conquered. The Moorish general made Theodemir governor of the province of Murcia, which was afterwards called in Arabic Theodemir's land. It may be added that the Moors set an excellent example to the Christians in their chivalrous treatment of their enemies. Centuries later, the victorious Spaniards addressed them as Knights of Granada, gentlemen, albeit Moors. Tariq had pushed on to Toledo, the Gothic capital, in quest of the nobles, but when a city was delivered into his hands by the Jews, he found his foes had fled into the mountains of the Asturias. Count Julian and other traitors remained and were rewarded with governmental posts, but the others had abandoned Spain to the Moors. And it became part of the immense empire of the Arab caliphs, whose court at Damascus governed a country stretching from the mountains of India to the pillars of Hercules. All that remained to be done for the pacification of Spain was accomplished by Musa, who crossed the Straits in the summer of 712 with 18,000 men, reduced Carmona, Seville and Merida and at Toledo met Tariq. He showed his insane jealousy of Tariq by striking him in the face with his whip when that victorious general begged his pardon for having disobeyed his orders, and by removing him from command but as soon as the news reached the Caliph Walid, he summoned Musa to Damascus and restored Tariq to the leadership in Spain. You do not need to be reminded of the dream of the followers of Muhammad who aimed to overrun all Europe and bring it under the green banner of the Prophet. Musa had reveled in the vision, but his recall ended that. In 719, however, an Arab leader occupied the southern part of Gaul and raided into Burgundy and Aquitania. In 721, the Saracens were defeated by Ud, Duke of Aquitania, in front of Toulouse, but the repulse only changed the course of the devastating wave to the westward. The invaders seized Avignon in 730 and desolated the neighboring districts. Then the new governor of Narbonne, Abderrahman, planned to conquer all Gaul. He checked Ud, who had tried to carry the war into the enemy's country, captured the Aquitanian's fair daughter Lampage, and sent her as a prize to Damascus. He now invaded Aquitaine, defeated Ud, captured Bordeaux, and, in 732, advanced in triumph toward Tours. Between that city and Poitiers Abderrahman met Charles Martel, the Hammer, who fought with him one of the decisive battles of the world. For upon its issue depended the question whether Europe was to be Christian or Mohammedan. The conflict was a stupendous one, but the Muslims were overthrown and driven from the field in a restrainable panic. Long after, the scene of the battle was known as the pavement of the martyrs, and never again did the Moors, through all the centuries they held sway in the south, attempt to invade France. But France had learned to respect the heroism and prowess of her swarthy neighbors and, though her troops indulged in occasional forays, there was little effort to subjugate the Moors. You have learned elsewhere of the attempt of Charlemagne in 777 to stamp out the Muslim power on the other side of the Pyrenees, and of his disastrous failure. The rear of his army was destroyed in the Pass of Roncesvalles by the treacherous Basques aided by the Saracens. It was on that dreadful day that Roland, the paladin, commander of the frontier of Brittany, fell, and his sad fate has been commemorated many times since in song and story. The triumph of Charles Martel having ended all possibility of the Saracen conquest of Europe, the Moors gave their attention to the work of consolidating the kingdom they had won. For nearly 300 years after the ill-starred invasion of Charlemagne they were hardly disturbed in their possession of the country. While some of the Goths in the mountainous districts of the north refused to yield and now and then regain small portions of their dominion, there was no real interference with the domination of the Moors until the 11th century. They did not think the conquest of the northern districts worth the cost. 
They, therefore, left Galicia, Leon, Castile and the Biscayne provinces to the Christians, and were content with the possession of the better part of the country. Thus it came about that Spain presented a peculiarity never seen before or since she was the home of two distinct races and civilizations, which for centuries flourished side by side. It was Christian in the north and Moslem in the south. Although opposed by blood and religion, the two peoples not only lived in comparative harmony, but in numberless instances displayed friendship and mutual regard. The reader should study the map and make careful note of the boundaries of these two extraordinary kingdoms. In a general way, the dividing line may be taken as the Sierra de Guadarrama Mountains, which extend northeasterly from Coimbra, in Portugal, to Saragossa from which point the Ebro can be accepted as the boundary. This division gave to the Moors the rich valleys of the Tagus, the Guadiana and the Guadalquivir, in addition to the famous cities of Andalusia, with their soft climate. Occasionally plagued by the hot winds from Africa, but well watered and capable of high cultivation, while the north was bleak, sometimes intensely cold, deluged with rains, and having few natural advantages other than good pasturage. These two divisions were separated by a large plateau, belonging chiefly to the Moors, who left it to the care of the descendants of the Berber tribes that first came to the country with Tariq. Two-thirds of the peninsula belonged to the invaders and was by them called Andalus, though the more familiar form of the name is Andalusia. It was there that these people founded the remarkable kingdom of Cordova, which was the wonder of the Middle Ages. While all the rest of Europe was sunk in the darkness of anarchy and ignorance, Cordova held aloft the beacon light of learning and civilization. Her rulers were wise, mild and just. Indeed, one of the unsolvable problems is where those people got their ability for administration, since they came from the flaming deserts of Arabia and never had the opportunity to acquire the difficult art in which, however, they showed themselves to be past masters. The Goths were always unable to rule to the satisfaction of their subjects, but Spain in all her history was never so contented, happy, and prosperous as under the Moors. The so-called religion of the Christians had made little impression upon the native Iberians. The one thing they yearned for was the privilege of living in security and peace, and that boon was given to them for the first time by those of another race, who were fanatical believers in a wholly different religion. The people were allowed to keep their own laws and judges, to collect the taxes and to adjust all differences among themselves. The citizen classes were required to pay only a moderate poll tax, instead of all the state expenditure, dot and they paid no other taxes unless they held cultivable land. While the poll tax was graduated according to the rank of the payer, being, however, a tax upon what was termed heresy, it was levied only upon the Christians and Jews, while all, including Muslims, had to share in the land tax. In most cases there was no disturbance of the property of cities or of the farming class. While the lands of the church and of those who had fled were confiscated, the serfs were allowed to cultivate them undisturbed, or were required to pay only a small portion to their new masters. In short, with the exception of the poll tax, the Christians did not suffer any more exactions than the Muslims. Moreover, they were permitted to sell their lands, which right they never possessed under their Gothic rulers. As regarded religion, they were not disturbed. Indeed, the poll tax assumed such big proportions that the frugal Arab preferred that no attempts should be made to turn the Goths from the error of their ways. Like many since, they decided not to let religion interfere with business. And it is not to be wondered at that the Christians of lower rank openly declared their preference for the rule of the Moors over that of the Goths. The Mohammedan rulers, however, were by no means at peace among themselves. It must not be supposed that the Arabs were a closely united people, even though all professed the faith of Islam. Bitter jealousies and enmities prevailed among many of the tribes. It was the militant character of Islamism that made it permanent and extended its boundaries so as to include millions of people. 
nor must it be imagined that the Mohammedans fought only to advance their faith. The hope of loot and booty was as potent to them as to professing Christian nations. Though their fanatical devotion to the cause of God and his prophet cannot be denied, so long as these turbulent warriors could be kept fighting, it was easy to hold them together, but Spain being conquered and themselves in quiet possession, the old jealousies and quarrels reappeared. For about 600 years most of the immense Mohammedan Empire was under the nominal authority of a central ruler, known as a caliph, which title means its successor. This caliph appointed the governors of all the provinces and removed them when he chose. So vast an empire, however, could not long be held together by a central point, and the power of the caliph steadily diminished, while the local governors, including the emir of Andalus, virtually became independent, though still professing loyalty to the caliph. In a furious contest between rival caliphs of the houses of the Abbasides and the Omeyads, all of the latter, except two, were treacherously slain. One of these succeeded in reaching a remote part of Arabia, where he and his descendants ruled for many years. The other, who bore the common name of Abdurrahman, left Damascus with horses and money, and by rapid flight over almost unknown paths joined a band of Bedouin, who received him hospitably. He remained a long time with them, often changing from one tribe to another through fear of his pursuers. He wandered through Egypt to Barca, where the governor, an ardent Abbasid, heard of his presence and sent out agents to arrest him. Escaping his enemies by the narrowest chance, he fled to the desert, where messengers came to him from Cordova with the offer of an independent crown. Though they warned him at the same time of the great personal peril he would have to face. He promptly accepted the offer, and, accompanied by some 700 picked horsemen, all fully armed, set out for turbulent Spain. The Abbasid emir in control of the country at that time, who was named Yusuf, received the startling news while returning from Saragossa. He made all haste homeward, sending messengers in every direction to summon troops to the defense of the endangered country. Abdurrahman was a strange compound. He was tall, athletic, brave, and of no mean mental ability. He had but one eye, lacked the sense of smell, and, while merciful and charitable when he chose to be, at other times was as remorseless as Satan himself. He landed on the southern coast of Spain early in 755 and was received with shouts of welcome, thousands flocking to his standard. The Abbasid ruler of the country made a brave resistance but was defeated and driven into exile, while Abdurrahman, in less than a year, suppressed all opposition and declared himself independent of the Caliph of Damascus. Thus the Mohammedan world was divided, and there reigned in Spain an independent Caliph of Cordova. What's good guys? This is not. You know, I want to hurry up and finish this entire thing. Now, um, the Christian Empire too is also a black empire. Um, it was the first people that actually went to Europe. Um, I forgot the name. But, um, so then, you know, they created that Christian Empire. That's why I always say the French Empire is a black empire. The only people that could be another black people is this black people. So just like Hannibal the Great, he went to um, um, Spain and he started kicking butt, the, the, the greatest military strategy. Then he went back to Africa because his his country in Africa was actually, you know, getting bullied by some other um, African guy or some other black guy. Um, and then from there he lost. So the only people that go back then, the only people that could defeat another uh, black person or black empire is only a black empire. So um, the Islamic Empire was just another empire. It was pretty much, you know, they they put everything under one banner, and that was Islam. Uh, the same thing that Christianity did when they actually went into Europe. They created Christianity from that. From um, I believe the guy name was Constance, Constance, Con, Constantine, whatever his name is. I'm a I will find um, a documentary and in the proof of that. But I read it a while back when when Christianity came about. Um, now, Islam, not Muslims, Islam been around long, Islam been around since Egypt was alive, Islam been around since, um, um, the Moors brought the Eurasian or the, what we know as the white people to 
um, the Phoenicians, and the Phoenicians took them to Europe. That's how Kanye was reading about the Phoenician was um, put in, you know, different settlements around Cad, Cadiz, of C A D I Z, um, you know, around that, because that's roughly around the same time when the U uh, European actually went went there through the hot desert, and then they actually crossed the hot desert to actually go to Spain. Um, but prior to that, there was already people in Spain, the Roman Empire, the Greeks Empire, the French Empire, all these empires was there. And also you heard that Latin, remember, every Arabic came from Latin, no matter what anybody say, if you put Latin, Spanish, and Arabic together, you, like, for example, for example, like pants, right, it's pantalones in Spanish, and it's pantalonas in Arabic, I believe, I'm not too sure, but it's still pantalon something. So therefore, like Arabic and Spanish is the same, is literally the same thing. Latin came about by the Romans. The Roman Empire had fell. It got taken over by the Eurasian, and then from there, um, you know, the Eurasian, the Eurasian obviously had like switched it up. But from there, um, the what's my call it? The Arab got the Latin languages, you know, and they used that to create their own. Um, not the Arabs, but the Africans, the Moors. The Moors got it, you know, used it to create their own language out of it. Um, um, who else had it? Um, other people in Spain got it. That's where um, Spanish came from. French, the language French came from. Italian language came from Latin. Um, all these other languages came from Latin. In fact, Latin is the... Um, um, Latin... The, the, the Latin language actually also derived directly from this side, the Maxim or Northwest Africa or America as we are known as today. Um, and then they took it from America and then carried it directly to Rome. And the Rome, and then, you know, the Romans actually took that and actually, you know, you know made it their own and then from there it just uh, you know, spread out all over. Um, even, I, I believe even the Mandingo language, which is the tribe that I came from, um, if you if, if I heard certain words that sound just like Latin, so the Mandate speakers also they derive their language from Latin. Latin when you know more, a lot of languages all around the world came from Latin. That's what they call it, the Latin languages. Um, it's not a religious thing. If you understand the history to its peak, it's just a conquest thing. So you know we're just conquering ourselves. So you know a black nation conquer another black nation. They conquer another black nation. They conquer another black nation. That's about all that was happening. But, you know, right now, um, that's why I say, like, when you take this religious ideology out of our head, it's good to, like, practice it, sure, but let's not, like, put our whole faith into it and, you know, say, well, you know, that's what God did because we've been around before even Christianity came about. Like, the first black people that left Africa and went all the way up to Europe, they the one who created that Christianity. Then the next group that went up there was the Moors, and they the one who came up they don't who created the Islamic one. So therefore, it's just two different um, political um, ideology that, you know, our ancestors came up with. Literally, it was our ancestors that came up with these things. And then, you know, they, they, both, they, you know, they both kept fighting eventually until one won. And right now, the winner is actually Christianity. So they don't actually dominate everything now. But either way, the Christianity to themselves is still our ancestor from far, far ago when they first left the actual land themselves. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to actually put that down. Um, in fact, even if you look at the Arabs, you know, um, they're the land. Remember, the original Arabs with dark and brown skin, they're your ancestors. The, the, the ones that's there right now are of lighter complexion. In fact, they came there as slaves by, the, um, they got captured at Portuguese. Um, I forgot Sicily, I forgot all the other Spanish plays when they kept rebelling against the Moors in Spain. So, um, Moor Abdul, he was the most ruthless. Again, if you see a picture of that dude, that dude looked just like me. In fact, his mom was a Malian because that's when Mali was, you know, at his peak. And his dad was an Arab. And he looked just like an African, African American, Jamaican, Haitian brother, you know, as somebody of brown, brown slash dark, darker complexion brother. So he looked just like that. We know with his little garment on next and everything else. So the Arab history, and he's from a royal, he's he's from a royal bloodline of the Arab. He was an Arab himself from the royal bloodline. I believe it was the Umayya, the Umayya um, tribe or whatever. But again, once again, those are still our people. Um, 
if you if you look at the history of tribe, we created tribe to preserve civilization, to make sure that you know we you know we continue growing. That's the only reason why we actually created all these tribal things. And then once we created tribe, those tribes slowly start becoming nations, empires, etc. But all of that was just to preserve um, our people so we you know we could be able to grow in harmony in peace. That's how the tribe is, but if you just cut all that down, those different tribes are still your tribe. Those different tribes are still in the same bloodline as you and I. So you know I just wanted to clarify that but yeah about the Arabs in North in North um, Africa. Um if you notice they believe in Islam, right? You know they're practicing and everything else, but look what they're doing. They're building skyscrapers, they're building whatever, you know, they're doing crazy things over there. So they're not just believing in some type of, they're not just believing in the faith, um, our ancestor faith. Um, but they're also actually like saying, well, listen, we could believe in it, but we're not going to put business, we're not going to, we're not going to mix business off of, with, we're not going to mix business with religion. We're never going to do that. So that's what we actually do. We mix business and religion up. We could believe in you know those things, we could practice it, but don't make it as if you know those things are like the crown of everything because it really wasn't. It was just a creation that our ancestors literally created. If you already seen, if you just read about it, the Moors went there and then they started pushing um, their the new idea they got so you know more people could join and that was the Muhammad Dain religion. Um, they did it in Africa. In fact, they went to Ghana. Who? They couldn't be the Ghanaians, bro. If you read the history of that, the the Moors, the Muslim Moors actually, they, even the Ghanaians too was Muslims. They everybody, everybody of of um of copper slash dark brown to Drake complexion or you know what they call now light skinned people, I guess. Um, they all was considered Moors. Even the Arabs was considered Moors too, by the way. So pretty much, you know, the um the Moors, the Muslim Moors went directly to uh, West Africa trying to conquer the Ghanaian Empire. He, they could they couldn't even like the Ghanaian um general, like the the, the military general, they couldn't even speak that dude. Like no matter how hard they try, they couldn't even step on him. Like literally, he like he like destroyed almost every single one of them until they they decided you know let old age handle that thing. We we quit. But you know later on, um, the Ghanaian Empire believed in the traditional spirituality faith, so it wasn't a Muslim empire, it wasn't a Christian empire. It was a, it was the original Egyptian um, faith, which was spirituality. Um, you know all these other religions got their stuff from the original Egyptian faith, which was just spirituality. In fact, Islam is actually just spirituality, not 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 the Mohammedan religion. That's why I say Islam been around since longer before even prophet muhammad or the muhammadan religion even came about because islam got their stuff directly from egypt they took their stuff from there from you know the egyptian grant them permission to come to northwest africa and also southwest africa which was america so north america and south america so the egyptian gave them permission to come here and then they took all the knowledge the egyptian knew and brought it here so everybody in in america are moors Literally, they were there before they, when they left there, came here with just another a group of Africans that left over there and came here and then created um, and kept and preserved the Islamic knowledge, which was the Egyptians' knowledge. That's all. That's, that's what they call it, Islam. But, you know, um, obviously the Moors on the other side, which is where you know, I'm from, um, North, North, North Africa decided, listen, you know, we're also going to, since this is Islam, we're also going to put the Mohammedan. Um, um, we're gonna stamp up Mohammedan religion on it, and we're gonna push that so everybody could join that club. Remember, the Mohammedan religion is just another club, but the the traditional the traditional African faith system was spirituality. is It's written on the Egyptian wall. The traditional African system was spirituality. We are spiritual people, so we know we our goal is to, to get closer to nature, closer to the divine. So that, that was the traditional one. Everything else came about just a way of conquering people. And once you conquer them, you force you force the actual religion in your throat and eventually until from there they stop questioning stuff and they just start believing it. So but you know, as a kid, people, you know, the kids question a lot. So if you just keep repeating it, eventually the question mindset goes out, out the window completely and they just believe in it and this thing, well, you know, so it was because of um, Allah, Jesus, Muhammad, whatever, you know, that did this, did that, did this. So, you know, the common sense got thrown out the way.
Um, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. In fact, they even said it themselves. Like, um, that's why I literally, I'm literally laying the play. This is from the white folks history, the, the heritage slash dash history.com. So this is their own, what they seen in Spain. So literally, mm-hmm. I have nothing to hide. In fact, I'm not just making this stuff up. You're actually hearing it for yourself. Um, yeah, so we're going to move on from there. Um, the Moors also, if you know, they didn't really, they believed in Islam, yeah, they respect the Prophet Muhammad, yes, um, but, you know, they also know for a fact, listen, we, we only care about trade, we're not gonna put, you know, the Moors, again, was brown and dark-skinned people from Africa, from America, they, from, from Af- from Africa all the way to America, the entire thing was called the Moorish Empire, meaning that the Moroccan Empire, that stretches from there to here. In fact, they also went through Spain. So before, before you know, the Moors fell in Spain, which is why slavery started. Um, it was from West Africa, the Mali Empire, when 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 the Ghanaian allowed the Muslim Moors to come in just to do trade. They said, you could come in, you could do trade, but don't try to conquer us, because you know you're not gonna win against that. So they came in, they started doing trade, and that's how the Ghanaian Empire fell, because people. The Africans that was in the Ghanaian Empire loved the Islamic ideology, loved especially the women. They loved wearing the scarf over their hair. They were just loving it. So eventually, slowly, everybody inside the Ghanaian Empire just started changing, um, forgetting their, their original spirituality system and actually just went to Islam. And then once that happened, the Ghanaian Empire fell and then the Mali Empire came about. So, um, but you know, I'm also let, I'm gonna find a documentary for that, not a documentary, but evidence for that. So, you know, you guys could actually, so I could actually play it so you guys could actually see. Um, I did a lot of studying in my days before. Uh, yeah, so technically, I forgot I was, I forgot what I was talking about, but technically that is it. So, let's move on to the next scene. So I can hurry up and finish with this and I can leave. Oh yeah, and I forgot one last thing. Um. Um, even, even the people the Moors came and conquer, they they really didn't come and conquer. They actually just wanted to go teach people because you know they heard that um, those burning women on like alive. So that's why that's the main reason the Moors actually wanted to um, actual. If you look at the history, that's the main reason they actually wanted to uh, Spain because you know that's that right. That's nah, yo, you guys are civilized. You guys need help. So they went there to actually make sure that like. They actually teach everybody. So that's why they actually created a center of learning, which was, uh, they said it, uh, Cordoba. That, that was the center of learning. Yeah, Cordoba. C- Cordoba. So um, where everybody from everywhere could come and actually, you know, they would teach them how to run governments, how, how um, you know, you know, math, um, reading, they, they taught them reading, math, um, um, how to properly structure stuff, etc., etc., fire in your arm. So, you know, when the Africans went there, they taught them everything about that. Um, now, obviously, though, uh, when they went there, don't, don't forget, don't think they only got people from North Africa. They also got people from West Africa. But, you know, they, again, all of them are the same people. But they went to West Africa, especially Mali. In fact, they went to Mali three times before they betrayed Mali, the last, the last and final time when they got their butt kicked in, uh, in Europe. So that's why that's why Mali Empire fell at the end too. So once they got their butt kicked, they went back to Mali to start killing everybody. Then Mali fell. So therefore, all the black empires in the world started falling when uh, the queen. You know, you, you'll hear about it. But um, yeah, so technically, that's it. I'm just you know going off again. Let me stop. Yeah, this was the last thing I forgot. Um, if you it was in here, it said that they preferred the Moors. You know, you know. Um, leadership than the Gothic because the Gothic wasn't wasn't letting them own land, um, you know they wasn't letting them do anything. Um, but the most leaders say, listen, you could do, you could do whatever you want to do. Uh, listen, I'm not we're not gonna force the Islamic religions on on you guys. You know you guys be you do whatever you want to do. Um, we're just gonna do us. So don't, you know don't interfere or whatever we're doing. Um, the more when the Moors went there, they didn't really kill anybody. Uh, once the people surrendered, they said, well you know we'll move on. So, um, that's about it. So if you notice, those very generous. In fact, that's what they call them, the knights. Whatever it's in here somewhere. I'm pretty much saying the knights of um, Granada or something like that. So pretty much like you know, very generous type of people.
And that's us, Africans. Very nice, very generous. But and the people always take advantage of us. And that's that, that and that's why we're in the boat that we're in right now. So we gotta learn from the past. Family established. Abderrahman set himself to work to improve the capital and under him and his successors, Cordova grew into a splendid city. With Aldivir was narrowed, and the space gained from the waters turned into beautiful flower gardens. He transplanted the palm into the peninsula, cultivated the soil more highly than before, and made the country one of the most delightful and attractive in the world. But to do all this, he acted with a harshness that was appalling, murdering and massacring all who dared to raise a hand against his iron authority. If the people feared, they also detested him, and he died a gloomy and unhappy man. His rule of 32 years was upheld by the swords of mercenaries whose bloody support he purchased with gold. And he sank into his grave amid curses instead of regrets and blessings. For nearly 300 years Spain was governed by the descendants of the House of Omeya, the first being the fugitive Abderrahman, and the mightiest, the conqueror Almanzar. During that period, the sovereigns had Okay, let's stop there. Okay, the Umaya. Um I was just talking about um um the guy himself. Um what what man, what was this at? One second, let me pause this and find Okay. Al Mansour. Who? This guy right here. Who? Remember, let's let's first look at a picture of this man. He was a ruthless. Remember, he he's from the Umayya people. Um, those those people was the Arabs, um, the Arab tribe, pretty much. Um, but if you look at his complexion, he's not Arab. He's straight up African or straight up black or Asian, uh, not Asian, Haitian, etc., etc., etc. So let's let's go on Google. Let 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 me let this thing load. Okay, this man did not play with um, everybody that was, um, was um, sure. everybody that was going against his Ralph. That's not him, that's the white version. This isn't him. It's the white version. The white wash. One second. Um Where's this picture at? Hmm. I'm gonna pause there. Like, well, I figure you guys could do the research yourself, but um, I can't find them at this time. You know, that's sad. Um, but here's some old old pictures of you know if you was wondering uh, how did the Moors look like? It was like dark skin looking people. Maybe they got some Drake complexion in there too, but listen, they're still the same people. Bright complexion, but you know, I mean, he, he looked like a lighter brown. Yeah, that's about all I know. Saving this picture. 
So we about to so we're gonna continue with the reading. Cause I can't find what I was looking for. But you know, this dude around here, you know, people was afraid of him. This guy. They was afraid of him. During that period, the sovereigns at Damascus were of the house of the Abbasides who were kept so busily employed at home in suppressing disorder that they had no time to give to concerns in Spain. To the period named belonged the most brilliant portion of the Moorish occupancy of the country. The government resembled that of the Eastern Caliphs, and the sovereign was called, like them, the commander of the faithful. The civilization of Moorish Spain became the wonder of Europe. Scholars flocked from all lands to the schools of Cordova. Science and the arts made rapid advancement. We are told that when the Greek emperor at Constantinople and the most gorgeous of Christian cities sent an ambassador to Cordova, the envoy fainted at sight of. Oh yeah, and also, the Moors was the one who introduced paper to um, Europe. Literally, paper. The envoy fainted at sight of the splendor that confronted him. Yet, as is so often unhappily the case, while the land increased in wealth and culture, it declined in virtue and military strength. Gradually, it broke up into a number of semi-independent little kingdoms, offering an easy reconquest to the advancing Christians. Okay. We have seen, secured peace under the one party. Let us turn now to the story of those Goths who fled from the fatal defeat of Roderick at Zeers. One party, as we have seen, secured peace under the crafty Theodomer and became subjects of the Moors in Mercia. Another band refused submission on any terms and fled northward till they could go no farther and found themselves in the mountains of Asturias, the coastland bordering the Bay of Biscay. This heroic little troop, reduced at one time, according to legend, to only thirty men, sought refuge in the mountain caves. Their leader was Palio, who may or may not have been a descendant of the ancient kings of the Goths. He was certainly a valiant warrior, from whom the present royal family of Spain is proud to trace its descent. While a Moorish army was hunting Palio and his men amid the mountain defiles, the fugitives suddenly hurled masses of rocks down upon their pursuers. And amid the confusion and death thus caused, charged boldly upon the entire army. The Moors were put to flight, and this Battle of Covadonga 720 marks the turning point in the tide of conquest. The Mohammedans recognized that the subjugation of those wild mountains was impossible, or at least not worth the cost. No second serious attempt seems to have been made to disturb Palio, and he rolled over the wild precipices and wilder men of the north, a king. If you choose to call him so, though we do not know that he ever took the title. His subjects, all mingling together, Goths, Romans, Celts, native Iberians, and we know not what fragments of other races, became the ancestors of the modern Spaniards, the Hidalgos, who pride themselves upon their blue and ardent blood. On the immediate successors of Palio we need not dwell. They were sturdy fighters all. Gradually they ventured out of the Asturian mountains into the plains to southward. Alfonso I extended his conquests to the capture of cities on the Douro River, so that the weight of his hand was felt over nearly a fourth of Spain. He did not, however, really rule this land, he only ravaged it, always returning to his region of refuge among the cliffs. It is from these early Spanish forays and fightings, guerrillas or little wars, as they called them, that we get our modern word for that cruel and barbaric system of surprise and licensed robbery, guerrilla warfare. About the year 910, that is, after nearly two centuries of this wild mountain life, King Garcia, or his brother, Ordofio II, ventured to desert their highland capital of Orviedo and establish their court permanently at Leon, a city of the plains. 
Ordofio II was buried there in 923 and from that time the Spanish state may be said to have assumed a permanent power and location. Its chiefs no longer depended on their caves for refuge but met the Moors upon equal terms. Their possessions, named from their new capital, became the Kingdom of Leon. At this time Castile was a waste borderland lying between the Christians and the Moors, and harried alternately by both a land of castles, as its name suggests. Strong places to which the inhabitants fled for refuge from the Marars. Aragon was still in possession of the Moors, Navarre was a wild, semi-independent mountain region, half Spanish and half French. The earliest of the Castilian heroes is Fernan González. He was the governor or count of Castile from 932 to 970, and successfully asserted the independence of the borderland of castles against the claims of the king of Leon to be regarded as its overlord. At one time Fernan was overpowered and imprisoned, but he had won the love of the princess Sanche of Navarre and she helped him to escape. Bribing his jailer and then guarding his flight with a troop of her wild Navarrese, she became Fernand's bride, and he made her both Countess and Queen of Castile, for he finally achieved the independence of his land. The city of Burgos was founded by his successor in 982 as the Castilian capital. Who at the Doubtless Fernan was much helped by the victories of Almanzar, a warlike Moorish chieftain, who at this period re-aroused the Muslim fanaticism and sought to urge his race to the complete reconquest of northern Spain. Almanzar repeatedly defeated the kings of Leon and finally stormed their capital and put all its population to the sword. Once more the Christians seemed on the point of being driven to take refuge in the mountains. Fortunately for them, Almanzar died. Maybe Fernand González defeated him first, maybe the king of Leon did, more probably they did not. The earlier Christian chroniclers merely tell us that at last God took pity on their great miseries, that a demon carried off Almanzar, that he died and was buried in hell. The slow advance of the Christian kingdoms recommenced. From all these centuries of battle Spanish romance has fastened upon two heroes especially at its own. They are Bernardo del Carpio and the Cid. Modern critics have insisted that history shall abandon Bernardo altogether. Romance makes him the chief hero of the Spanish resistance to Charlemagne's inroad, which seems, by the way, to have been directed quite as much against Christians as against Moors. Bernardo is represented as the Spanish leader at the victory of Roncesvalles. He slays most of Charlemagne's paladins, and finally, finding Roland's armor invincible to sword blow, takes the Frankish champion in his arms and strangles him to death. The Cid, on the other hand, is a positive historic figure who lived toward the end of the 11th century. It is not our province to separate carefully the real from the fanciful in his career. He was one of the leading nobles of Castile, and when, in 1072, his sovereign was assassinated, the Cid consented with his peers, though most unwillingly, to acknowledge the next heir as their king. This heir was Alfonso VI, King of Leon, and thus the two kingdoms were once more united. Though by this time Castile had grown to be the greater and more important of the two. Castile's first hero, Fernan González, had separated the kingdoms, the Cid, her most celebrated hero, saw them reunited. The Cid's real name was Rodrigo Diaz, the title by which he is generally known, El Cid Campador, meaning merely the Señor, or Lord Champion. Before Rodrigo would submit to his new king, Alfonso, he insisted on that monarch's making oath that he had taken no part in the assassination of the previous king. Naturally the ceremony did not please Alfonso, and he and the Cid were never friends. Indeed, the Cid soon found himself a banished man, and went forth on his good steed Bevica to carve a kingdom for himself from troublous Spain. We find him warring now in one service, now in another, lending his mighty sword, if truth must be told, to Moors as well as Christians. At length he gathered such strength and wealth and so many followers that he set up as a king on his own account in eastern Spain, and, in 1094, 
he undertook the most gigantic enterprise of his fierce career. Next to Cordova, the most powerful city of the Moors was Valencia on the eastern coast. The Cid besieged Valencia and captured it after a desperate resistance. He wanted it for his capital city, but unfortunately the Moors also recognized its value. Again and again they endeavored to retake it each time the Cid repulsed them. Finally, in 1099, he died, and the Moors coming again to assault Valencia, we are told that his followers placed his dead body on horseback and rode out behind it. The mere sight of the Cid was enough, and once more his enemies fled. This method of defense seems, however, to have had no permanent value, for a year or so later Valencia was easily retaken by the Moors. In the meantime the Cid's despised sovereign Alfonso VI had made a conquest of more permanent effect. In 1095 he recovered from the Moors the city of Toledo which had been the ancient capital of Gothic Spain. We may, therefore, fairly consider this period to indicate that the balance of power in the peninsula was at last inclining to the Christian side. Indeed, Alfonso is said to have marched his forces right through to the southern coast and stood in mail-clad might upon the shores of Gibraltar's strait. The coming of new hordes of Mohammedans into Spain saved their dominion from extinction. Alfonso was defeated, Valencia recaptured. The newcomers, however, were not civilized like the Spanish Moors, they were barbarians, and the opulent magnificence of Andalusia declined as their power increased. In the course of a half-century these wild Africans drew all the Moorish power into their own hands and reinforced by armies of their African kinsmen. Started out once more to conquer Spain and Europe. A crusade was preached against them. Warriors from all over Europe hurried to Toledo where Alfonso IX, King of Castile and Leon, held his court. The Crusaders met the foe in a great battle on the borders of the southern mountain land in the region called the Novice Fields de Toulouse, July 16, 1212. The result was long doubtful, but in the end the Mohammedans fled, and their power in the west was broken forever. The Moors were not, however, immediately driven from Spain. Alfonso IX, well content with having repelled the great African invasion, disbanded his costly army of Crusaders and went back to his capital. He died soon after and left it to his grandson, Fernando III, St. Fernando, to reap the fruits of his victory. Fernando captured the ancient Moorish capital of Cordova in 1235 and soon after, by adding Seville to his dominions, extended them to the southern ocean. At this period, then, there were five kingdoms in Spain. Castilian Leon was the central and most powerful one, its bounds touching the coastline on the north, west, and south but the Moorish kingdom of Granada still lay in the extreme south, Portugal was in the extreme west, and Navarre among the northern mountains. While all eastern Spain had been gathered into the kingdom of Aragon, second only to Castile in power and importance. Aragon had grown slowly with the centuries. Its independence of Castile and Leon had been positively established in 1096 when its king, Pedro I, aided by the Cid, won the Battle of Alcoraz against both Moors and Castilians. The Aragonese king, Alfonso the Battler, 1104-1134, well nigh conquered all Spain, but the Moors slew him in battle, and his power disappeared with his death. Pedro II lent a generous and most efficient help to Castile in the great battle of Toulouse, and then came his son, James, called the Conqueror, who made Aragon permanently an important state. One of the powers of Europe The first exploit of James the Conqueror was the conquest of the Balearic Isles from the Moors in 1228. To win these he had to build the fleet, and for the first time Spain disputed the Mohammedan sovereignty of the Mediterranean and its islands. James then conquered the great city of Valencia, which had been the glory and death of the Cid. The new conqueror, however, wisely retained his own seat of government, the safer inland capital of Saragossa. Pedro III, son and successor of James, interfered in the quarrels of Italy and became king of Sicily. 
This drew him into a quarrel with France and a powerful French army invaded his country. The heroic defense of one city after another wore out the invaders. They died in great numbers, and Pedro drove the exhausted remnant back through the Pyrenees into their own country. His ships, under his great admiral, Roger de Loria, twice defeated and shattered all the naval force of France. Thus Aragon was fairly established as a naval power, a kingdom of islands stretching from Spain to Italy, the equal and rival of France and of Castile. Of Alfonso X of Castile, 1252-1284, Alfonso the Wise, we need hardly speak except to remind you that he was elected emperor of Germany during the great interregnum there. He was a learned busybody, feebly intruding himself everywhere, dot and accomplishing nothing, with the best of intentions. He was, however, a really noteworthy scholar, the earliest to appear among the kings of Europe. Pedro of Castile, 1350-1369, the cruel, is only memorable as the miserable and bloody tyrant who called the English black prince into Spain to save him from his infuriated subjects. The French also entered the peninsula, upholding the cause of Pedro's rival and brother, Henry, and the land was a prey to horrors of every kind. The Black Prince defeated the French in a great battle at Navarre and restored Pedro to power, but the knave cheated him out of his pay, starved the English army, and let the prince wander back to Bordeaux, a prey to the disease from which he died. The rebels under Henry took heart once more. Pedro was besieged in a small castle and, seeking escape, met Henry in a personal and undignified squabble. Each stabbed at the other with a dagger, and the cruel king was slain. Henry succeeded to the throne of the exhausted land as Henry XI, 1369-1379. These and similar dissensions had delayed the final expulsion of the Moors for over two centuries. At last Henry IV, 1454-1474, on coming to the throne of Castile, announced his intention of leading his subjects in a final crusade against the Mohammedans. The warlike Castilians took up the project eagerly, but Henry proved to have neither the valor nor the wisdom necessary for a general. He led his armies year after year into the Moorish territories, but dared not risk a serious battle, contenting himself with establishing a strong camp, from which small parties were dispatched to burn and plunder. Henry's people finally became so disgusted that many rebelled against him and the nation thus returned to its favorite pastime of civil war. The insurgents set up a young half-brother of Henry as his rival, and the lad was so successful that he is sometimes included in Spain's list of kings as Alfonso XI. He died suddenly, perhaps poisoned. The rebels besought his sister, Isabella, to take his place, and thus comes into our pages that fair young lady, the greatest and most striking figure in all Spain's story. The queen to whom she owes both her greatness and her fall. In of Ferdinand and Isabella was made noteworthy by the three greatest events of Spanish history, first, the final conquest of the Moors, and the consequent expulsion of that able race from the peninsula, second, the discovery of America, with its vast resulting increase of Spanish territory and wealth, third, the enforcement of the Inquisition and the establishment of a religious intolerance so severe as utterly to crush the intelligence of the people. Personally, Isabella must have been among the noblest of women. She was deeply and thoughtfully religious. No faintest shade rests upon her moral character. She was shrewd and tactful, wise, far-sighted, and ready for all highest thoughts and enthusiasms. Perhaps she was a paragon of beauty as well. But one must not accept too blindly the profuse extravagance of adulation with which courtier chronicles portray the features of a young and powerful queen. In the very first act with which Isabella comes before our notice, she displayed both patriotism and wisdom. Being urged by the ablest and most honorable of the Castilians to head the rebellion against her feeble and wicked half-brother, Henry, she refused. 
and insisted that the factions should become reconciled. Her course endeared her to all parties except, indeed, the capricious king, who had no wish to see her more popular than himself. Under Isabella's influence a peace was arranged by which Isabella was declared the heir to the feeble and fast-aging king, with the right of selecting her own husband. You may be sure that suitors without number hastened to compete for the hand of the charming heiress to so rich a kingdom. The brother of crafty old Louis XI of France was a candidate, as was the Duke of Clarence, brother of Edward IV, the triumphant York King of England. The King of Portugal also came to woo and managed to enlist the Spanish King so strongly in his favor that Isabella found herself in much danger of being forced into the match. By this time, however, she had made her own choice of a partner, one far more suitable than either the treacherous English duke, the sickly French prince, or the widowed Portuguese king. Aragon had, as we have seen, grown to be a powerful state. Navarre had recently been added to the Aragonian dominion, and the kingdom, what with its navy and its Italian possessions, was almost, if not quite, the equal of its neighbor. The oldest son and heir of the Kingdom of Aragon was Ferdinand, a youth of eighteen, who had naturally made his bid for Isabella among the rest. She caused inquiries to be made as to his character, and learned that he was handsome, manly, and clever. Just which of the three characteristics moved her most you must guess for yourself, she was only a year older than the young prince himself. At any rate, she sent Ferdinand word that if he wanted her he must come in haste and take her. Indeed, it was high time. Her brother, King Henry, was party to a plot to carry her off secretly and marry her to whom he pleased. A few of her own partisans saved her by fleeing with her in hot haste to Valladolid before the conspirators arrived. Efforts were made to waylay Ferdinand upon the frontier, and he had to slip into the country in disguise and with insufficient money to pay his expenses. It was all very exciting and romantic, and Ferdinand won his way to his lady like a true knight-errant. And they were hastily married amid the shouting of the good people of Valladolid, for all the world loves lovers, and though this young pair had never before seen each other, still the efforts to keep them apart had doubtless made them lovers for all that. King Henry did his best after that to deprive his sister of her inheritance, but he died only four years later, 1474, of mingled age and depravity. And thus the young queen and her husband succeeded to the throne of Castile and Leon. The disappointed king of Portugal attempted to fight them for it, but Ferdinand, who had wisely kept in the background during his wife's coronation, now came vigorously forward and at the head of the Castilian forces defeated the Portuguese so completely that a peace was soon arranged, which included a promise of marriage between the Portuguese king's son and the baby girl just born to Isabella. Five years later Ferdinand's father died and he became king of Aragon in his own right. Thus at last all the little Christian kingdoms of the Spanish peninsula were, with the exception of Portugal, united under this youthful royal couple and seldom have a pair seemed better mated, or king and queen proved abler. Each was wise, earnest, and energetic. We are told that Isabella was an inch taller as she was a year older than her husband, but Ferdinand was not the man to be overshadowed in any company. And though we cannot find for his cold nature the same admiration we give to her intense and holy spirit, Yet it may well be that his strength and caution were just the qualities needed to give weight and success to her less calculated impulses. Indeed Isabella seldom came forward, leaving the task of government to her husband, except when her deeper enthusiasms were aroused. It was she who insisted that, in the name of Christianity the task dropped by her brother must be taken up and the Moorish kingdom of Granada subjugated at last. The mighty city of Granada was then the most populous in Spain. It had been founded by the Moors in the 8th century and for a time remained subject to the Caliphs of Cordova. 
It was made capital of the province of Granada in 1235 and rapidly acquired distinction for its trade and wealth and as the seat of arts and architecture. By the end of the 15th century its population was nearly half a million, and the city was enclosed by a wall with more than a million towers. One of the most famous structures of the world is the Alhambra, which was begun in 1248 and completed just a hundred years later. The fortress which bore that name formed a part of the citadel of Granada, which contained the palace of the ancient Moorish kings. The Spaniards call the remains of the palace the Casa Real. They are ranged around two oblong courts, the Court of the Fish Pond and the Court of the Lions. Nothing can surpass the richness of the ornamentation and the elegance of the columns and arches. Yet the Moors themselves began to be sunk in sensual sloth. Bobdal, at this time their king's son, was educated rather as a girl than a boy in oriental anger and idleness. No time could have been more favorable for the grand campaign of Ferdinand and Isabella, for not only was the whole Spanish people fired by one resolve, but there was bickering and wrangling among the different factions in Granada. Though they were so defiant and self-confident that they anticipated the sovereigns by striking the first blow and captured the notable stronghold of Zahara. This last exploit of the Moors in Spain has such historical value that we quote the account of our own brilliant Washington Irving. In the year of our Lord, 1481, and but a night or two after the festival of the Most Blessed Nativity, the inhabitants of Zahara were sunk in profound sleep, the very sentinel had deserted his post and sought shelter from a tempest which had raged without for three nights in succession for it appeared but little probable that an enemy would be abroad during such an uproar of the elements. But evil spirits work best during a storm. In the midst of the night an uproar rose within the walls of Zahara, more awful than the raging of the storm. A fearful alarm cry, the more, the more, resounded through the streets, mingled with the clash of arms, the shriek of anguish, and the shout of victory. Muley Abu Wan Hassan, at the head of a powerful force, had hurried from Granada and passed unobserved through the mountains in the obscurity of the tempest. While the storm pelted the sentinel from his post and howled around tower and battlement, the Moors had planted their scaling ladders and mounted securely into both town and castle. The garrison was unsuspicious of danger until battle and massacre burst forth within its very walls. It seemed to the affrighted inhabitants as if the fiends of the air had come upon the wings of the wind and possessed themselves of tower and turret. The war cry resounded on every side shout answering shout in the streets of the town, the foe was in all parts. Wrapped in obscurity, but acting in concert by the aid of preconcerted signals, starting from sleep, the soldiers were intercepted and cut down as they rushed from their quarters or... If they escaped, they knew not where to assemble or where to strike. Whenever lights appeared, the flashing scimitar was at its deadly work and all who attempted resistance fell beneath its edge. In a little while the struggle was at an end. Those who were not slain took refuge in the secret places of their houses or gave themselves up as captives. The clash of arms ceased, and the storm continued its howling, mingled with the occasional shout of the Moorish soldiery roaming in search of plunder. While the inhabitants were trembling for their fate, a trumpet resounded through the streets, summoning them all to assemble, unarmed, in the public square. Here they were surrounded by soldiery, and strictly guarded until daybreak. When the day dawned, it was piteous to behold this once prosperous community, which had lain down to rest in peaceful security, now crowded together without distinction of age, or rank, or sex, and almost without raiment, during the severity of a winter storm. The fierce Muley Abu Hassan turned a deaf ear to all remonstrances and ordered them to be conducted captives to Granada. Leaving a strong garrison in both town and castle with orders to put them in a complete state of defense, he returned flushed with victory to his capital. Entering it at the head of the troops, laden with spoil, and bearing in triumph the banners and pennons taken at Zahara. 
while preparations were making for jousts and other festivities in honor of this victory over the Christians, the captives of Zahara arrived, a wretched train of men, women, and children. Worn out with fatigue and haggard with despair and driven like cattle into the city gates by a detachment of Moorish soldiery. This disaster roused the Spaniards to fury. Henceforward the war was pressed with unrelenting vigor. Hardly had Muley Abul Hassan reached Granada when he found that the Christians had seized one of the bulwarks of his capital. There was still discord among the defenders and, at last, in 1491, the Spanish army settled itself before the capital for the final siege. To encourage the soldiers, Isabella herself came and resided in the camp, and she had it built into a regular city, the city of Santa Fe, Holy Faith as a warning to the Moors that she meant to dwell there permanently until they surrendered. There were gallant deeds of valor on both sides, but the persistency of Isabella in the civil strife among the Moors left but one ending possible. None saw this more clearly than the Arab leaders, who opened negotiations for surrender. Bobdal, who had forcibly wrenched the Moorish crown from Abul Hassan, his father, accepted the inevitable and made his preparations for the surrender of the city which took place on the 2nd of January, 1492. Accompanied by two score cavaliers, he rode out to the plain where Ferdinand and Isabella, surrounded by their gorgeous court, awaited him. Had not the Christian king prevented, Bogdal would have dismounted and knelt in token of his homage. Ferdinand spoke soothing words and showed the fallen sovereign all courtesy and honor. He made his submission and abdication also to Isabella and then, accompanied by his mother, rode away. At some distance on a rocky elevation, Bobdal paused and looked back at the citadel and fortress of Alhambra and, while the tears filled his eyes, mournfully contemplated the kingdom he had lost. The spot is still pointed out and bears the name of El Ultimo Suspiro del Moro, the last sigh of the Moor. Spain, so long distracted and torn by civil war, was consolidated into one compact, powerful empire, extending from the Pyrenees to the Strait of Gibraltar. And at the same time she acquired an immense domain in the New World. The story of America's discovery needs no repetition. Let us, however, stop to recall King Ferdinand's treatment of Columbus. His plans were referred to a court of judges, mostly churchmen at Salamanca, and these laughed at him as a madman. He was turning from Spain in despair after seven years of wasted entreaty when another churchman brought his project to the notice of Isabella. After Granada is conquered, I will listen to him, said the single-minded queen. So Columbus went to her camp city of Santa Fe, and we can imagine him wielding an enthusiast sword against the heathen Moors. Then, when Granada fell, he had a personal audience with the sovereigns, and when Ferdinand turned away from him as a madman, Isabella, stirred by the dream of converting an entire world to Christianity, spoke her famous decision, I will undertake the enterprise for mine own crown of Castile, and am ready to pawn my crown jewels for the expense. So, you see, Aragon, if we may still discriminate between the United Spanish Kingdoms, had no part in the momentous expedition. Isabella's crown jewels were not pawned, though her offer of them was no idle speech, so low had the royal treasury sunk in the long struggle with Granada. A year later Columbus returned in triumph, and at once hundreds of Spanish cavaliers, having lost the excitement of war at home, sought adventure in the newly discovered world. Columbus became only one of a thousand sailors to those distant climes, and wealth hitherto undreamed of poured into Spain. Even before Isabella's death in 1504, the condition of the land had changed marvelously. What with the sudden influx of wealth, the union of the little kingdoms, and the ability of her sovereigns, Spain stepped at one stride into the foremost place among European countries. 
yet even in this the moment of Spain's triumph were sown the seeds which have led to her decay. The causes which joined to weaken Spain irreparably were the drain made by the flocking to the New World. Of thousands who supposed that gold was as plentiful there as the stones in the streets at home. The establishment of the Inquisition and the driving out of the remaining Moors and Jews, who vainly hoped that the terms of the surrender of Granada would be kept. Ferdinand and Isabella were fanatical in their religious faith and could not rest until it was firmly established throughout the kingdom. Those of the Moors, or Moriscos, as they came to be called, who would abjure their religion and accept the new one were allowed to stay, otherwise they were exiled and were not permitted to carry their accumulated wealth away with them. Some of the Moriscos accepted outwardly the new religion, but they hated their oppressors with an inextinguishable hatred. They were ordered to throw aside their picturesque costume and wear that of the Christians, they were forbidden to bathe, and must remain as unclean as their conquerors. They were prohibited from using their accustomed ceremonies, were commanded to speak only the Spanish language, and even to change their names to conform with the detested tongue. In short, they were to become Spaniards in the fullest sense. In 1526 Charles V confirmed this cruel decree, and, though he was prudent enough not to enforce it rigidly, it served to wring torturing bribes from the sufferers. The Inquisition had had a nominal existence for a long time in Spain and Portugal but it was first rigidly enforced under Ferdinand and Isabella. The pretext being the discovery of certain sinister plots among the Jews. The application, in 1478, to Pope Sixtus IV. For the reorganization of the Inquisition was followed by the action of the Crown in appointing the Inquisitors and taking sole charge of the whole horrible business. The Pope protested, but the Spanish crown maintained its assumption, and, in 1483, the Inquisition opened its appalling work under Thomas de Torquemada. In 1492, just after the surrender of Granada, its cruelty expelled the Jews from Spain in a body, torturing all who remained and refused Christianity. Then the Pope tried to lessen the rigors of the tribunal, but little or no attention was paid to his protests. The historian Urente asserts that during the 16 years that Torquemada held office, 9,000 people were condemned to the flames, and that his successor in eight years put 1,600 to a similar death. Other historians declare the statements of Urente grossly exaggerated, but making all possible deductions from his figures. The work of the Inquisition in the new as well as the old world was frightful beyond description. Let us sum up briefly the subsequent history of this terrible engine. Its severity was abated in Spain in the latter part of the 17th century, and under Joseph Bonaparte it was repressed in 1808 until the Restoration. Suppressed again on the establishment of the new constitution in 1820, partially revived five years later, and finally abolished in 1835. The persecution and deportation of the Moriscos continued until 1610, when the last half million were driven out after the previous exiles. With their destruction vanished the culture, refinement, the arts and sciences that had made southern Spain a beacon light among the nations of the world. all for now um there's more to it but you know we're not gonna read that um i just wanted to show you guys proof and evidence through um their history that um the moors was people that actually ruled spain for over 700 or more years 
until they got their butt kicked and they got, you know, left. Um, and then after that, that's when the Queen, Queen, um, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, um, you know, um, decided that all Moors' descent should be in bondage or kill. Well, yeah, bondage, slavery, whatever, or kill. So, you know, that's when the entire slavery, the slave trade started, and then um, they was burning, like, all the books, all the Moors' book in um, Spain, just so we don't, actually, just so we don't know who we are, and, you know, who our descendants are. Um, and from there, they hide all the texts, um, they teach the youth that um, they only came from slavery, etc., etc., and uh, from there, you know, this is where we at now in this day, DNA, to teach the youth that, and also Queen Isabella decided that um, Christianity should be thrown on every single, everybody, so Christianity should be the, the dominating thing in the world, so um, a lot of Moors that got conquered in Spain, the conqueror became the conqueror, you know, the conqueror. Um, um, a lot of those Moors changed to um, um, Christ, uh, Christianity. Once that had happened, um, uh, the, I think it was Queen, the King Fetterman decided that um, everybody should change their Muslim names to a Christian name. So instead of Al Abdul Muhammad or Al something or um, Mansa Musa or you know all those. Um, Islamic sounded looking name is to change it to like uh, you know Christian name like Taj or John or uh, Joshua you know those type of names so you know that's where those you know those new Christian names came about um, but yeah so technically that's that's about it I'm gonna give you the website so you know if you want to go view more about you know this long history of ours sure here it is um, you're typing it in yourself. I'm not typing it for you, but it's right over here. Or you can just Google it. And you can to continue reading it. Um, yeah, and that's it. And, you know, I'm done. So I'm officially finished with this African Moors history. Um, so, you know, we, we need to get out the mindset that, you know, our history is from some type of slavery type thing because it never did. Um, our history is more than rich from long long descent so you know let's just keep that in mind as we move forward all right peace so i'm officially done with this now